Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. Let's start with the story. That's what we do. So I heard a story about another church, kind of like our church, where you begin asking the why questions. Why do we do things the way we do them? Has anyone ever thought of this, right? So what did we do years ago? Started going to the Word. This is the way we should do it. So they started going through all their programs and all their things and trying to get them as aligned as they could with the Bible. And so finally they get to missions. And they looked at what we're going to be seeing today. And they said, we really don't do missions like that. You know, we just kind of put a clipboard out. Nobody really prays about it. We go to some place. And sometimes we've been there over and over again. Sometimes doing the same projects again, seeing the same people is this mission. So they decided, you know what, let's just do what they did in the Bible. And we're going to fast and pray. And we're going to ask a question. So we're all going to fast and pray. We're going to go do our own thing for a while. And we're going to see what we hear from the Lord. They fast, they pray, they ask, where? Where do you want us to go, Lord? They all come back together and they all come up with the same answer. The Middle East. So now they're going to go away and pray and ask another question. Who? And that's where, you know, if they're being honest with you, they're praying, not me, not me, not me, not me, right? So <laughs> we don't want to go on that mission trip, right? So they're praying, they're praying, and nobody hears anything except wait. Okay, we'll wait. A couple weeks later, new guy comes into church. After the service, where are you from? Well, He's like, well, actually, I'm from out of state, but I'm originally from the Middle East. I felt called to missions, but the Lord sent me here to this church. We know why. Prayer answered. So they train him up and they send him, but they have a different strategy. He's not going to start a church dangerous over there. He's going to do something a little bit different. He's going to get a job, right? So it's not a big expense for the church. He's going to get a job, but somewhere where he has a lot of exposure to people. He can talk about Jesus. So he decides... I'm going to get a job as a server in a restaurant. Perfect, right? I can talk to a lot of people and just serve. I'm going to be the best server ever and then talk about Jesus. And it works. About a year later, this guy could run for mayor and win. It's amazing. He knows everybody, but the government doesn't like it. And he's spreading Jesus. That's not popular there. So they really want to kill him. But they can't. He's really popular. And so, no, 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 we're going to start a riot like they're worried about in the Bible. What do we do? So <clears throat> the government officials have a meeting, and one of them says, you know what? Let's hire him. Huh? Yeah, let's hire the guy. And then what we could do is give him an office job in the basement somewhere. We'll <laughs> just hide him away. Like, if you're familiar, well, George Costanza him, right? So you put him in that office, one person got it. Okay, good. So <laughs> anyway, funny show. But <laughs> that's where I get a lot of my, what is the deal with missions? Anyway, so, <laughs> so couldn't help it. Anyway, so I put him away. So you're like, you know what? This is, this is, a, yes, and now you're not going to ever see me the same way again. <laughs> but this is a really good idea. So go to the restaurant, send one of the guys in, offer him, like they find out he's making about 25000 a year, offer him 50000 a year. The guy they send like, I don't even get paid that much, but okay. So he goes, they have a conversation, he says, hey, you know what? I can get you, you don't have to wait tables all day and run around, I can get you a nice desk job in the air conditioning for 50000 what do you think about that? And this missionary waiter says, no, refuses it. Okay, so he goes back. And now they're kind of angry, really, but his supervisor says, you know what? Offer him $100,000. He can't refuse that. It's crazy. Four times as much. The guy's like, oh, I wish you'd give me 100000 Anyway, so he goes to the restaurant, and he tells the waiter, look, my boss said $100,000. No, I don't want it. Now he's mad. He's like, listen, are you crazy? I don't even make that much money. He's insulted. He's like, you're just nuts. What's wrong with you? Is it not enough money? Is the pay not big enough for you? And he says, oh, it's not the pay that's not big enough. It's the job that's not big enough. 
So today, we're going to talk about, and there's no joke. That was it. The Seinfeld thing was the joke. It's not always funny. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> I don't need a joke today. I don't think it's going to be that hard, right? I don't have to break the ice too much. So today, we're going to be looking at the big job of missions and really thinking about it. And we're going to grab it from the text. We're going to start in the text. That's what we do here at C3 Church. If you're new, everything comes from this. Uh, so, you know, we do have kind of like a verse of the day problem in Christianity, right? So people just read that verse and then randomly another verse somewhere else and randomly another verse somewhere else. And that's why they don't understand the Bible at all, right? Because they're just hopping around from one sentence to another. You want to read larger portions of the text and then zoom in when you get the point, when you know what it's about. So today we're going to be doing Acts 12 through 14, but not all of it. We're just not going to have the time. So I will paraphrase some stuff for you and point some things out, like your tour guide on the way. I'll stop the bus, point something out for you, and we're going to keep moving. But this is not to kind of you know, dismiss the text. I encourage everyone here, read. Go read it for yourself. Don't believe me or anyone else. Just believe that. All right. So I'll overview it best as I can for you, and then we'll kind of get to missions here, and we'll take a look at that. So we ended at Acts 11. We saw the church at Antioch. They're getting a collection together for Jerusalem where there's going to be a famine. This is where they're first called Christians for the first time. And so what you have in Acts, Luke is just, well, of course, Holy Spirit driven, right? But a brilliant writer, you know, a man working with God, like that M.C. Escher hand in hand thing. So Luke is going to insert some of himself in here, and he's just a great writer. A smart guy, a doctor, uses big words, really, really hard to read in Greek. Um, but he does these cut scenes. So he's going to be here and then cut away scene to here. So now we're going to cut to uh, Herod Agrippa, and we're going to see that the church gets persecuted. So we're going to go back and forth to Antioch, and then Herod, the stuff about Herod's in between. So you're going to see James is killed. This is James of James and John. He's killed by the sword. Now, it's really funny. We're going to get to James. We're going to insert James in this series. Uh, when you begin reading Greek, one of the things that you notice when you get better at it is that it doesn't say James. It says Jacob. That's his name. So you have my permission. You can cross out James and write Jacob. <laughs> so anytime that, that name appears in the New Testament, it's Jacob in Greek. So he's killed. Things to note on the tour this morning. There's no violence. Remember? Martyr. Right? The, the origin for that word is witness in Greek. If you're reading it in Greek, you'll notice it looks a lot like martyr. Yes, because that's where the word comes from. <clears throat> Again, a nonviolent movement here. Uh, Peter, he's put in prison. Right? So King Herod thinks, ah, that made people happy with Jesus. I'm going to kill him after the Passover festival. So he has these guards, like 16 guards guarding him. And what's happening is, again, you've got to notice this. What do they do? They take him, he's going to get killed. He's thinking he's going to die, right? They started an army. <laughs> they got their two swords, remember? <laughs> then they started an army and to break them out. No, it specifically says they prayed. They're praying. And it works. <laughs> so an angel busts him out of prison by prayer. It's amazing. So bright light and everything is like, Peter, get your clothes. Let's go. Hits him on the side and he leads him out. <laughs> the chains just fall off him. There's two guards, one on either side of him. Chains fall off him. He passes by the first guard tower, second guard tower, to the city gate. It opens for him. He thinks it's like a dream or something. He has no idea, and he realizes, the Lord just broke me out of jail. So he goes to John Mark's house, and his mother, many, many, many Marys. Remember we did that? Many Marys. Goes to John Mark's house, and we have a scene that's kind of like Jesus' resurrection scene when you think about it. And so John Mark, author of the Gospel of Mark, Rhoda goes to answer the door, hears Peter's voice. His mom's name is Mary. <clears throat> hears Peter's voice, gets so excited that she, like, leaves him out there and goes to tell everybody. Peter's kind of like, <laughs> just broke out of jail, people, like, let me in, All right? So she's telling him, and it's a scene, right, like, like the resurrection. The woman believes, but the men inside out, they don't believe. They're like, no, it must be his angel or his ghost, right? So it said the same thing about Jesus. He's a ghost. He's like, no, no, I'm not. Check it out. Same type of scene. But finally, they go get him inside. He explains what happens, and then he just says he goes to another place. Then, cut scene back to Herod Agrippa again, responsible for all this. He has the guards killed. That was what would happen to Roman guards. Uh, so, interrogated, he has them put to death if you lose your prisoner. So, not very good. We'll see that kind of almost happen again later. Uh, not today, but later. So, 
<laughs> he caps off what happens to Herod. Basically, he's, he's angry with people, Tyre and Sidon, I believe. He's angry with those people. They send a delegation and try to make peace. And then they talk to this guy, Blastus, who's his assistant, King Herod. And they make the peace. And he gives a speech. And they're like, oh, it's like the voice of a god. They begin to kind of worship him. He accepts this worship. And so God strikes him dead. It says he gets ill and then dies, and then worms eat him. So it's like the end of Isaiah, right? Because you get buried, worms are going to eat you. I believe it's Josephus who also wrote a historian about this story. He said he had a horrible like, stomach illness and died. So that's what happens to King Agrippa. So you see, well, we're going to see a contrast between what happens to him in accepting the worship and Peter, for, or Paul, actually, for example. So cut scene. Back to Saul and Barnabas. Acts 12.24. Meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread, and there were many new believers. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, literally in Greek, the service, to Jerusalem, they returned taking John Mark with them. We're going to see that later. So now we're going to go back to Antioch here. Acts 13.1. Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, who is called Niger, literally is what it says, Lucius from Cyrene, Menaean, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Then or they went down to the seaport of Seleucia, and then they sailed for the island of Cyprus. There, in the town of Salamis, they, met a Jew, uh, well, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them, this time as their assistant. So now, they're going to keep traveling across the entire island. They finally reached a place called Paphos, or Paphos where they met a Jewish sorcerer, uh, Bar-Jesus or Elymas. So he's attached himself to the governor there, Sergius Paulus. And what happens is he's convincing Elemis is like, if you're Greek, you, it's like uh, elixir. So you can pay, like a sorcerer, basically. It says it means uh, sorcerer, but you can attach it to that. So anyway, he's convincing the governor, don't listen to these guys. He's a false prophet. And so Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, and here's where it says, Saul, also known as Paul. So this is where you get that now. It's like the big reveal, as if you didn't know before. Maybe you didn't. You're like, oh, this is Paul. This is amazing. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He calls him a son of the devil which is really funny because Bar-Jesus means son of Jesus. So there's like this contrast of probably why Paul is saying that. You're no son of Jesus. You're a son of the devil and God's hand, the Lord's hand of punishment is going to come upon you and you're not going to be able to see for a long time. And so this is what happened to Paul. So Paul basically inflicts what happened to him on this guy by the power of the Lord and he's blind, he's groping around. And so Sergius Paulus, the governor there, sees this and he becomes a believer. He's amazed. So big transformation there. We see that Paul preaches in Antioch of Pisidia, and this is where John Mark leaves them. This will be important later, but John Mark leaves them. And so he's uh, sailing by ship for Pamphylia. On the Sabbath this is what they do. They go in. So on the Sabbath, they go to the synagogues. There's no, like, church per se yet. They're just still worshiping in the temple from home to home in the synagogue. So that's their habit. They go there, and they get asked to speak when they're there. If you have any encouragement, let's hear it. So now Paul gives a sermon, and it's like a mashup of what you heard from Stephen, what you heard from Peter. So he's going to go through some of the history of the Old Testament, build to Jesus, you killed Jesus, right? But he's the Messiah. Now this is going out to you, salvation. So as Paul and Barnabas left the synagogue that day, the people begged them to speak about these things again the next week. Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. So the following week, it doesn't go as well because they start getting jealous. They get haters, right? So they get jealous because they're attracting all these crowds. So Paul says, you've rejected the salvation. You've judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life, and we'll offer it to the Gentiles. <clears throat> For the Lord gave us his command when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the farthest corners of the earth. So that was really like the theme we were looking at. So this is going out to the Gentiles too, that breakdown. So the Gentiles are like, Yes! You know, so they're very excited. The Jew's not happy. So it's like last week. We have all these Gentiles coming to the Lord. But, Acts 13.50, 
And then the Jews stirred up the influential religious women and leaders of the city, and they incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas and ran them out of town. So they shook the dust from their feet as a sign of rejection and went to the town of Iconium, and the believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So this is just like what Jesus says, right, to his apostles when he sent them the first time. If they reject you, shake the dust from your feet. It's kind of like we do this today, right? I'm out. So that's what they did. Weird chapter break, and that's why, like, the chapters, just in case you didn't know, they weren't added until about 1200 A.D. All the numbers in your Bible, they weren't there. Neither were the headings. So this is a really good example of a very strange chapter break <laughs> because Acts 14.1 starts with, the same thing happened in Iconium. So if you just started on 14, you'd be like, what thing? You know, <laughs> so it doesn't make sense. So anyway, just try to put it together. Same thing happened in Iconium. Paul and Barnabas went into the Jewish synagogue and preached with such power that a great number of both Jews and Greeks became believers. Some Jews, however, spurned God's message and poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against Paul and Barnabas. But the apostles stayed there a long time, preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord. And the Lord proved their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. But the people of the town were divided in their opinion about them. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. Then a mob of Gentiles and Jews, along with their leaders, decided to attack and stone them. So throw rocks at them until they die. And when the apostles learned of it, they fled. Notice that again. What did they do? They threw rocks back at them. Nope, doesn't say that. They fled to the region of Lycaonia, to the towns of Lystra and Derbe and the surrounding area. And there they preached the good news. So note, missions can be dangerous. It could get you killed. And still today, there are certain places it could get you killed. So note though, right, so we don't go do missions to the Middle East. What do we bring with us? An AK-47, right? So we don't, you're not going to get on the plane with that. But, <laughs> but we don't do that today. It's understood that that's not how we're supposed to spread the gospel. Yet some would say otherwise. So while they're in Lystra, there's a man, it's kind of an interesting thing, it's kind of hard to understand if you don't know any Greek mythology, but I'll just kind of explain it the best I know how. So while they're there, there's a man who's never walked. He's got crippled feet. And so Paul, seeing that he has faith to be healed, says, stand up. And the guy, boom, pops right up and he's jumping for joy. He's happy, he's walking. And so what the people there decide is that they're gods. They're Greek gods come in human form. And so they decide that Barnabas was Zeus and Paul was, uh, like, because he's a good speaker, Hermes, like he's his chief speaker. And so the thing is, though, they have this temple to Zeus right outside the town. And so they think, wow, this much must be the gods, because they have these fake gods, and they actually do something. And it'd probably be rare that people would actually do something in a false religion. So this happens, and they're totally amazed. So what they do, you know, to them, they think it's good. They get a bull and like with wreaths all around it and stuff. They get all this stuff to worship them with. They're going <laughs> to worship. And so you got to think, like, uh, imagine spending a lot of money on something and someone rejecting that gift. So this is kind of what Paul does, Paul and Barnabas do, right? So they tear their clothes. That's what you do in the ancient world. If you're upset, especially Jewish people, they would tear their clothes, sometimes throw dust on their head, doesn't say that here, but tear their clothes with grief. And they're like, no. And, and Paul's very, very short statement sounds a lot like Romans chapter one, if you're really familiar with the Bible, right? Essentially, the idea here is you're worshiping the creation, not the creator, guys. You're getting it wrong. This is bad. So they reject their gift. They put down their gift. And so now... Some Jews arrive, right, and they want to kill them, and they're like, ha-ha, they take advantage of it. And so it goes really, really bad. So crowds, they're trying to, they stone Paul, and crowds come, they stone Paul, they drag him out of town, and they think he's dead. So something really interesting happened. The believers gather around him, and he gets up and goes back into the town. You serious? If someone, like, just... Stone me to death. Right? I'm not going back there, but he does. What a faithful servant. So now, Paul and Barnabas are going to return. So it's the story of their return. Acts 14, 21. After preaching the good news in Derby and making many disciples, Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch of Pisidia. So there's two Antiochs, right? One of Syria, one of Pisidia. Sorry, I didn't mention that before. Where they strengthened the believers. They encouraged them to continue in the faith, reminding them, that we must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. I haven't heard that come up as the verse of the day on my app. <laughs> Paul and Barnabas also appointed elders in every church with prayer and fasting. Notice that comes up a lot. They turned the elders over to the care of the Lord in whom they had put their trust. 
Then they traveled back through Pisidia to Pamphylia. They preached the word in Perga, then went down to Italia. Finally, they returned by ship to Antioch of Syria, where their journey had begun. The believers there had entrusted them to the grace of God to do the work they had now completed. Upon arriving in Antioch, they called the church together and reporting everything God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles too. And they stayed there with the believers for a long time. So, we see Paul's first mission trip, his first missional journey. We see some of the themes that we saw last week, returning, uh, reaching the Gentiles, suffering for Jesus. We also see the operation of the church. So this is where we get a really good glimpse of that. How does the church operate? How do they appoint their missionaries? How do they appoint their leaders? Note, if you read that longer section, right? If we just did one chapter, you might not have caught that. But you caught it. Prayer and fasting in both cases. It's like the same formula that they keep using to appoint these, you know, leaders, these elders in that case, or <clears throat> these missionaries. So what I want to do today is let's look more closely at what missions looks like biblically, like, and then how we fit it into our culture, how <clears throat> we can get it there. Now, I am going to talk about, this is a disclaimer, so if you stop the message right in the middle, you don't watch, if you're watching online, you might think by some of the things I'm saying, or if you're not attentive, you might think, is he saying we shouldn't do missions? Absolutely not. This is not whether we should do missions or not. We clearly should. It's how we do missions. So hear that how we do missions. I'm not saying no, right? So I'm not the Grinch of missions, just so you get that. And yes, that time of year is coming up again. Really? That's crazy. Or did the stores just shove it down our throat? Anyway, not going to digress too much. So let's look at some verses that people typically use uh, for missions. So this is a big one. If you've been a Christian your whole life, you've heard a missionary use this. So remember, Jesus has risen from the dead. He's about to ascend into heaven. It's the end of the gospel of Matthew. Matthew 28, 16. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee. As I'm reading this, I want you to pay attention. Think in your head, like remember reading comprehension in school, who, what, when, where, why, right? The 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, and I've explained this to you. Ethne, think ethnicities. Go to all the different peoples everywhere, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, who? Eleven, Judas is dead. Hang on. Eleven disciples. All right? Apostles. So let me explain something to you. And this is really, really funny because, you know, exegesis and hermeneutics and you learn all this stuff. Who, what, when, where, what? <laughs> Make it simple. If you did that to this text the same way you do it to any other text, you'd come away with something like, well, Jesus was giving specifically his 11 leftover apostles instructions, Right? to go and make more disciples of all different peoples. And if you know Greek, it, it looks more like in Greek, you know, just different nationalities, different ethnicities, all right? Maybe nations, that's fine, whatever, right? So this, this is to his, right. But everybody, I don't think so. You wouldn't get that takeaway if you're reading it correctly. And if you kept reading all the way to Acts, you'd get this, Acts 1.1. Luke is writing, in my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving who? His chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. So, explain something to you. If you don't know Greek, if you know Greek, it's totally obvious because apostello means I send. Apostle means sent one, one who is sent. That's just what it means. It's simple. But here's the thing. If you keep reading your Bible, which I highly recommend, um, <laughs> you'll get to 1 Corinthians, and you're going to see something kind of interesting. All right, so 
lots of problems <laughs> in Corinth, just like the church today. Are we any different? But one of the problems is, like, they have these gifts of the Holy Spirit, and some of them are getting puffed up with pride about it, right? Like, you know, I'm an apostle or whatever it is, or I'm a prophet, or I speak in tongues, and you don't. And so <laughs> Paul's going to get to 1 Corinthians 12, and that's the context here, right? So uh, he's talking about the body of Christ. And he does something funny, which if you don't know Greek, you might not understand. He's making like the hand or like the foot talk to the hand, right? Or the ear talk to an eye. If I'm not an eye, I'm not a part of the body. This is called prosopopoeia in Greek. Paul uses it a couple times, Romans 7 and here. And it's like, it's, uh, in Greek, it's called to make a face, right? So it's a puppet show he's kind of doing for these people. He's making this silly kind of illustration, but here's the point. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. All of you together are Christ's body. And each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. First, apostles. Second are prophets. Third are teachers. Then those who do miracles. Those who have the gift of healing. Those who can help others. Those who have the gift of leadership. Those who speak in unknown languages or tongues, literally. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in tongues or unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret, which he says later is very important? Of course not. Good translation, because what's, what's happening in the Greek is it's no, it's, it's rhetoric. It's no. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. And if you've ever been to a wedding, that's what you heard there, right? 1 Corinthians 13. Love. So what's the point? Oh, great. You know what I mean? Like, you may have that gift. You may have that gift. You may have... If you don't have love, what? You're like a noisy instrument. Love is more important than all this stuff. So there you go. But here's the point. We are not all apostles. And it can mean sent one. It's not just used. There's like capital A and lower, lowercase a apostles, right? Paphroditus in Philippians is called an apostle, but he's not one of those original apostles. But what does it mean? He was sent to Paul while Paul's in prison. So he's an apostle. He's a sent one. So not all are sent ones. Not all even speak in tongues. A lot of denominations are like, what? But <laughs> not all speak in tongues. But here's the thing. We all have the base obligation to witness to Jesus, but we're not all apostles. Or there's no word for missionary in the Bible. It's not there. It's apostle. That's what it is. You're an apostle if you're a missionary. The church does what? Fast, prays, lays hands on you, and sends you. Not everybody are. Did you see what happened in the church? Right? That all those people in there who were chosen? Two. That's it. Holy Spirit says go. So that's the thing. So not everybody's what we would think of as a missionary. So here's the next thing. That's the first thing. We're not all called to missions. It's not our job. Just not everyone's called to teach. Clearly, not everyone's called to sing. Right? So, okay, good. But uh, hey, I was good. Not you. You're good, you, I, maybe by yourself in the car, in the shower, someplace like that. Here, that's why we turn it up real loud. Anyway, <laughs> I had to, we have a thing. It's okay, we joke. Um, <laughs> all right, so the next thing about missions is this. So now that we understand that, from what? Not Pastor Gene's opinion, from the Word of God. That's who said it, not me, right? So now that we understand that, we have to make a distinction. Here's another problem that the church has. We have to make the distinction between missions and visiting somebody. You see how they went back through and they visited people? Missions and visit. Not every like visit to a foreign country is a mission, especially if you've been there 15,000 times, you know, or they know Jesus. It's not a mission. You're visiting someone. So Paul makes this distinction of note in 2 Corinthians 10, but it's a different context. In Romans, when he writes to the Romans, Tertius is penning it for him, helping him out. He writes to a church he's never been to before. That's what he's talking. You've got to understand that. He's never been there. And so as he nears the end of the letter, he's going to write, he writes this, Romans 15, 20. My ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard, rather than where a church has already been started by someone else. Huh. Check this out. I've been following the plan spoken of in the scriptures where it says those who have never been told about him will see and those who have never heard of him will understand. Paul's following the scriptures. Imagine that. So of note, he's quoting the Greek Old Testament, not the Hebrew. <clears throat> in fact, my visit to you has been delayed so long because I've been preaching in these places. But now I have finished my work in these regions and after 
all these long years of waiting, I'm eager to visit you. I am planning to go to Spain for a mission. And when I do, I will stop off in Rome. And after I've enjoyed your fellowship for a little while, you can provide for my journey. So here's the interesting thing. And this is why I put the disclaimer. Again, I'm not saying we shouldn't do missions. Most missions today that the church does are visits and vacations. Spiritual tourism, that has been called. That's most missions today. They're going to a place where people already know Jesus. And there are more and more articles about this coming out. Because it is a $2 billion a year industry. Spiritual tourism called missions. But here's the thing. If you call it missions, it's hard for people to say no, isn't it? Well, you're not going to support me. I thought you were a Christian. You're not going to support my mission trip? <laughs> so they're, they're getting people to pay for their own Christian spiritual tourism, their own experiences. And that's what people will say when faced with this most pastor. Well, it's good for the believer. You know, it's edifying. And they learn what it's like, you know, outside of Naples, right? We're in a bubble. So, so you know, you go to another country. And that's great. If it's for your spiritual edification, go. But I'm not paying for it. And neither is the church. It should be on your dime. All right? So that's the difference. Two billion dollars to go places we've already been. So we need to stop calling them missions and start calling them field trips. That's what we need to start doing. Let's be honest. All right, so the other thing here is, and this is a really big one. It used to annoy us a lot because we had a thrift store for a while. And um, they always wanted to show where the money was going. I was like, to the church. Right? You know, they're like, no, no, we need it. And we had like all these mission organizations that we gave money to, right? Which was just a waste because they figured more, you know, because you're giving each one of them a hundred bucks or something where you could just give one, all the money and do some good. No, we're going to spread it out because more is better, right? And they needed a poster all the time to show everyone what we were doing. And I was like, they're supporting the church. <laughs> like what has become wrong with that? Like, I don't understand it. So here, what do we see today? Just look at the Word of God. Forget what you know if you've been a Christian for a long time. Try. Biblical missions are always through the church. They're always done through the church. First and foremost, the church is a mission organization which spreads the gospel locally and online out to other people and sends or supports missionaries who are trained, appointed, and anointed to do that work. And how do we do it? We pray, we fast, we ask the Lord to send the right people in or provide us with the right people. That's how it's done. So the, this is the function of the church. It's exactly what we saw in today's account. Right? And it keeps happening throughout the Word of God. So you end up with two, two problems. I already, I already talked about like field tripping on the church's dime. Not cool. You know, just not cool. There's a lot of like work that needs to be done. <clears throat> but you also have what... A lot of pastors will call because we know about it. Uh, the parachurch. It's called the parachurch. And so this falls under the category. Some mission organizations kind of are. Um, some ministries kind of are. Um, and so what happens is <laughs> their organization started, and I'll explain to you how these, these leaders uh, are appointed. They started outside the church, right? <clears throat> Wrong. <laughs> Everything's birthed through church because it has that anointing, the accountability, the structure, the biblical structure. So they are ministries or Christian organizations without the biblical structure. How do you think that's going to work out? Uh-huh. You know what I mean? It's not good. It, doesn't, it lacks the structure required by the Word of God. They're not biblical. And so what happens is time and time again, and we've had it happen in the church, and it's just, it can get aggravating. When? Just check it out. If you're in my position... And if you've ever been in church leadership, you know this and how it works. You know, if you're doing it right, and we're trying to do it right here, so I'm fasting, I'm praying, I'm asking the other leadership, and we have a rule here at the church. If even one person thinks it's a bad idea, I scrap it, even if, like, I really wanted it. Nope. It has to be just like the Word of God says. One mind. Unanimous agreement. I do, we, we're all trained to just let it go. We're like, nope, okay, good, let's move on. Done. One mind. Bless you. Unanimous agreement. That's, that's what we need here. That's what we're looking for. So we go back, we, we got to fast and pray again. We have to go and pray again. Just, that's it. And we come together and bam, it's always unanimous when it's right. 
right? So one mind. And we're doing things like this. So we go through this whole process. And then some other missionary comes in. Where's your church? I don't have a church. You know, not attached to any of that. Not a pastor. Not any of that stuff. And comes in and starts telling us, like, where we have to spend our money. You just came in here and, you know, it's, and you're telling a leadership that has fasted and prayed and made this decision. And think about it for a second. It would be annoying. Like, think about working your job. You like when people tell you how to do your job? <laughs> it's like that. And it's also very insulting because it's like, yeah, I don't think you heard from Holy Spirit right. What? No. No. You know, so we've gotten better and better, like, at just really saying, go away. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like stop it. You know, it's like stray cat syndrome. These people come through. And here's the problem. And you have to be very cautious just for you. So for a leader, you're like, what does it have to do with me? Well, what it has to do with you is this. You have to be very careful because these people will come through, and it's like a routine. And so this could be individuals. Some individuals will come through. Ministries will come through. Some mission organizations will come through. They talk to us first, usually. And then we say, no, sometimes. Sometimes, yes, if it's like we prayed about it. So the guy in the illustration will come in. That's literally happened. And I'm like, Oh, but that's what we're waiting for, right? So, we're, But not that guy comes in, asks us for a bunch of money, and we're like, you know. sometimes it could be an individual, and we've given them money. We always do that. It's a real, well, not money. We give, like, gift cards, some food. You'll see afterwards. I'll tell you how you can get a free meal if that's what you need, right? So we feed them. We do everything we can to help, right? And then they come again, and then they come again, and, they, and then we start working. I work with a lot of other organizations, David Lawrence Center, Cal Cal or County Homeless Coalition, a lot of different people like that. And I start connecting them, doing my case management. So I'm working on this. I know it. Very few people come in here. Where I don't know everything about you. And you're always like, don't say it. <laughs> so anyway, I, I know what you're going through. I know what you need. And I know what you don't need. And sometimes, like, I've given you piles of fish. And now you need to go fish, right? We've been through it. But then when I say no, they go ask someone else in the church for money. Wrong. And so if you do that, you could be enabling someone, right? So you'd be very careful. If anyone in the church, just if you're deciding to come here or if you come here for a long time, no one should ask you for money. No one. Tell them to see Gene. See, go see Gene. Ask Gene. And if they're like, no, it's because they already did. And I said, no, right? <laughs> no, one, no one should ask you for money, especially if they're a ministry or a mission organization. No individual. Ask them for their solicitation permit. That's what Heather does. She's really good at that. People don't like her. You're supposed to have one of those. Anyway, they do the tech. I don't even deal with money. I have no idea. I'm like, I don't know. Go see the board. Go see Ed. See Heather. Right? So that's the thing. And here's a note. Like when have I ever, I feel like Samuel now if you know it, right? When have I ever asked any of you for money, right? <laughs> you know, for me, right? Like doesn't the church take care of that? It's called double dipping. Right? You're not supposed to do that. Here's the thing. Missions are supposed to be done in ministries by appointed people. That's what we see in these accounts, right? So what did it say? Paul and Barnabas also appointed elders in every church with prayer and fasting. They turned the elders over to the care of the Lord in whom they had put their trust the right way. I want to take you to Titus because this is really what Titus is about. Three-chapter book, Paul is writing to Titus, who he's appointed, anointed, left him in Crete, to appoint more elders or overseers, it can be interchangeable sometimes, <clears throat> sends them to that island to do it. And I just want you to pay attention to something when we're thinking about people who've gone outside the church realm and say, eh, I don't want any of that. I'm going to do my own thing. Not appointed by anybody. Titus 1.5, Paul's writing, I left you on the island of Crete so you could complete our work there and Appoint elders. Look at that. It keeps coming up. In each town, as I instructed you, an elder must live a blameless life. He must be faithful to his wife, one woman man in the Greek, and his children must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious. A church leader, overseer in this case, he switched, is a manager of God's household. So he must live a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. He must not be a heavy drinker, drunk with wine, literally, violent or dishonest with money. Rather, he must enjoy having guests in his home. It just says hospitable because that applies to the church too, right? Then he must love what is good. He must live wisely and be just. He must live a devout and disciplined life. Huh. He must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught. Then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and to show those who oppose it where they're wrong. So here's what happens. 
And I've had this happen. I've had people come in and say, how long does it take to be a pastor? I'm like, I need my buzzer out. Like, wrong question. Right? This is a calling, not a career. We ask you into it. Like, right? You know, what are the, you know, you hit them with the qualifications and they're like, devout and disciplined. Life. Are you kidding? I got to give up like, you know, chocolate. Like, whatever. So <laughs> whatever your thing is, right? You got to give it up. <laughs> they don't like it. Takes too long. How long did five years working one on one with my Paul? Five years. He was able to open up my phone, look under my bed, had an interview with my wife every week. That's true. And they're like, nope. It's much easier to go and start a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It takes about a year. And then just do whatever you want. Go around saying, Lord told you, Lord told you, and ask everybody for money. And that's exactly what happens. No, I'm not saying they're all bad. Again, what was my disclaimer in the beginning, right? It's okay, but it should always be attached to a church with that accountability over it and the proper process. If it does not have that, it's not biblical. It's not by the word of God. Those who are qualified, did you notice? It sounds a lot like the fruit of the Spirit. Because it is, we should be filled with the fruit of the Spirit. Teaching being qualification, 1 Timothy 3. It's also there, must be able to teach. Articulate the gospel where you are. These leaders fast, pray, wait for confirmation. They do it the right way because biblical missions and ministries are guided by the Holy Spirit. All right? Not our clipboards, not like a map in a dart, you know? Like, no. They're guided by the Holy Spirit. He will tell us what to do and what not to do. If we jump ahead real quick and peek in Acts 16, we see something interesting. Acts 16, 6. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word, of, the word in the province of Asia at that time. And then again, then coming to the brothers of Mycenae, they headed, sorry, borders of Mycenae, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. He has a plan. Imagine that. So instead, they went on through Mycia to the seaport of Troas. The Holy Spirit should be guiding missions, not people. That's important. And so just to be real with you guys, I just want to share a couple of experiences with you that we've had real experiences at this church that we've had. We have developed this culture of like, Clipboard ministries. That's why I always said, like, when we were doing it and it was wrong, I always wanted to put a clipboard up that said, like, you know, Iraq. You know, we were going to see who signed up. You know, someone would sign Paul up. You know, like, sign Paul up. He'll go. He's <laughs> thrown to death, goes back to the same town. So, you know, you know but it, it's just, it, I've seen it as a great way to turn a hobby into a nonprofit. This happens a lot. And I can tell you a couple cases. And if you're local, you may know who I'm talking about. I won't say him by name. But... This really happened. This is a real, this is a real story. So we, we, uh, we supported this mission organization many years ago, and uh, they wanted to do a mission trip to Costa Rica, and I thought, that sounds nice. You know, it'd be like, it's a vacation, right? So, you know, but I didn't get it yet, you know, whatever. I was just, uh, I think I was, not the, it's a bad thing, I wasn't a pastor yet or trained properly. I was on the worship team, I think, at the time. And... Um, uh, <laughs> So fine, you're going to go to Costa Rica. And there was this like urgent need there. There was something having to do with baby formulas and things they were running out of or whatever. So the church spent lots of money. We put together tons of money, hundreds if not thousands of dollars, all kinds of money on these vital supplies to send them with. Right? They went on the mission trip and they forgot the supplies. You know what they remembered? Their surfboards. And that is a true story. Huh. Really. Then, like, a couple years later, and this, I became a pastor <clears throat> a few years later, uh, they announced at this big thing, and if I had known, really thought about this, I wasn't uh, the lead pastor at the time. I wouldn't have even let it happen. They, they got up and said that they were going to do a mission trip to Rio, Brazil. Okay, if you don't know me, uh, I spent a large portion of my life with Brazilians, them living with, literally living with me. I had to become a Brazilian and integrate into that culture to gain their trust because of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, right? Uh, because I was a gringo. Right? <laughs> so it was difficult. When you look like me, they don't like you. So in their culture at that time, I guess. So anyway, look, I've met a lot of Brazilians. I'm still very close, uh, really great friends with a lot of Brazilian people. They're all Christians. <laughs> They're all Christians. Rio 
De Janeiro. The Jesus statue, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? That's where you're going to go. Like, I, I almost laughed, and then I kind of got a little angry. I was like, I want to go. <laughs> like, this is nuts. They didn't say, we're going to the Amazon. And even then, I know, I know pastors there. They would say, stop. <laughs> we go to the Amazon. Let us do that. Just send us the money, please, that you're going to spend. I'm thinking, but what do they want to do? They, the surf is very good there. That's why Rio. You think the Holy Spirit told him to go to Rio? I don't think so. You know what I mean? It's just, and when you look at these things, and so it's so ingrained in our Christian culture, right? That like, how dare you, Pastor Gene, right? We talked about that. If I was here to please people, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. So anyway, no codependency here. But people don't like it, right? Because it's just a part of the culture. It's just what we do. What are you saying? You don't support missions? I don't support Christian field trips. I don't support spiritual tourism. You do that. And my wife and I, we've had this joke for years because we saw how ridiculous. We, we come from the business world initially, right? So, you know, we see things like for what they are and we just call it out. We're like, that doesn't look that stupid. Like, you know, whatever, right? So we made a joke. Like, we've just been going to Disney for years and drop the politics or whatever. It's not about that. Like, so we've just been going there for years. This is what we do. It's just, we've been doing it since we were dating. And so we were like, you know what? There are people literally from all over the world here right now. It's kind of like Jerusalem in Acts, right? Everybody, this is shooting fish in a barrel, right? So, you know, what if we get Jesus t-shirts and then we promise to talk about Jesus in the parks and everywhere we go, would the church pay for our mission trip? <laughs> we didn't. Yeah. But if I ask you to do that, you're going to laugh. But why aren't you laughing at the people who are trying to get you to pay for their surfing trips? Or their bicycle riding trips or whatever it is. Why aren't you laughing at that? It is as ridiculous as it looks. It's ridiculous. They're visits, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to go visit your friends, I, know, I don't surf, but you know what I mean? Like, that's fine. But I'm not going to ask you to, like, I really miss my friends in Brazil, but I'm going to preach there. Can you guys pay for that? No, don't. I'm not going to ask. It's ridiculous. You already know Jesus there. That's not a mission. Stop it. It's a visit. And again, there's nothing, hear me, there's nothing wrong with visiting. There's no, it's great. But don't ask the church to pay for it. It's not what that's for, right? So again, it's a great way to get people to pay for your help. And if any of you do this today, you will get rebuked from the stage. <laughs> how do you start a five? That's the question. Like, out of all this stuff I tell, somebody's going to come up to me and they're going to say, how do you start a 501c3? <laughs> right? So that's what you get. No. Right? But to a lot of people, it's a great way to get the church to pay for their hobbies. That's what it is. And it's really hard to say no to missions, isn't it? You look like the bad guy. That's called manipulation. That's what that's called. Now, you may be sitting there saying, I don't care, <laughs> right? Like, who cares? Well, guard yourself. But here's the thing. We may not all be missionaries, but we're all on mission to love our neighbor, to spread the gospel in that way to the people just around us by loving people. But here's the thing. If we look at the process for missions, and here's your personal application before we close, we can apply these things for our everyday lives. So it's not just the church. The church is like a picture of what your life should look like as you're living it. So you can apply these principles to your life. So what do they do? Now, this is really interesting. And you guys are not going to like this, but it's okay. Fasting. Think about it. Think about all the junk we put in our bodies. And if you've ever, you ever done like a fast, or you just even start to, and I'm not going to give like a health speech or anything. It's not what this is about. It's just being real, right? So if you start eating clean, Right? You stop like drinking stuff with tons of sugar and drugs. It's drugs. Caffeine's a drug, you know. It's like cocaine, you know. You stop doing coke. <laughs> you know, you stop doing that. You stop putting all the poison in your body. You'll notice something. Clarity. Clarity. You sleep better. You wake up better. You think faster. You no caffeine in me right now. This is the Holy Spirit, by the way. That's all. <laughs> when I get done, I'm like, <laughs> right? So he's using me. Tiring. But anyway... Right, so there's that. But I'm just, let's talk about the practical, right? So you, the Holy Spirit can be working in you, but if you poison yourself, he's not obligated to unpoison you. 
Stop, you know, so clarity, clarity. To help you make these decisions, think clearly, understand the word. You won't be so foggy. Right? So I quit some of this stuff a long time ago. Caffeine makes me feel like I'm going to have a heart attack now. Like I can't even have any of it. Like certain sugars, like I'll shake, you know. You don't realize what it's doing to you. And I don't know if anyone here has been a smoker, is a smoker. Like I was a smoker for many, many years. And like, you know, your first cigarette, I was really, really young, way too young. Like eight, <laughs> like I was really young. But anyway, but first thing, I felt like I was going to die. Like, I'm dying. Like, my oxygen's gone. What's happening? Right? <laughs> like, dying. But then I don't know why. Oh, drugs, nicotine, you do it again, right? And do it again until you can tolerate it. It's not that the cigarette's doing any less damage. It's just that you're used to killing yourself now. That's what's happening. Same thing with all the poison we put in our bodies. So, again, I'm not getting on like a health kick here, but listen, this is a temple of God. You are obligated to take care of it, right? So, that's the thing. The other thing, too. Prayer. See, you are what you eat. That's it. Well, you also become what you digest with your eyes and your ears. And now I'm not going to get legalistic about secular movies. I watch them. Secular music, it's fine. Once you get strong enough in the Lord, you can just be like, whatever, right? You know. so, that's not what I'm talking about. But, but the amount, the quantity of poison that people are putting in their eyes and their ears it infects your mind. So just be careful about, you know, if, if you're strong in the Lord, start thinking about the quantity of this garbage that you're digesting into your brain. You know, limit it. Cut it out. Turn it off. Pray. Read the Word of God. Listen to Him. You can't hear Him when all this noise is all around. You can't. You need to pray, right? So it's about just stop. I want to think clearly, hear you clearly, Lord. Like, just develop that relationship. Then we can let the Holy Spirit guide our lives. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be led by, and sometimes we don't even know why. I do all the time. I'm like, I don't know, I just feel like I got to go there. And then all of a sudden, something crazy happens when I go there. I'm like, huh, that's really weird. I call them God incidences now. It's, there's no coincidence. It's unbelievable. But the more I'm listening to them, the more of them I get. It's insane. But only by listening. And then when I'm not, I can tell because they don't happen. So it's important. We come up with a lot of ideas on our own, but they're not always good ones. The other thing, just for some encouragement today, expect resistance. Tried to stone Paul. Expect the gospel's offensive. I mean, it's not our job. We shouldn't be like, we should be leading with love, but we don't like it. Also, here's what people don't like, self-improvement. When someone doesn't want to improve, they do not, this is like me as a dad talking to our older brother, this is practical advice. When someone does not want to improve themselves, and you do, you talk. You talk to them. Even if you don't say a word, you say, ah, either you, point, you begin pointing out their faults without even thinking it's not your fault, but you do. And so using my wife's story, sober, nine years. Right? Just doesn't drink, that's it. Sober, nine years, miraculous. But you don't drink. So when someone has a problem with drinking, you can always tell. They hate her. They hate her. There are a lot of people that hate my wife. She's really pretty. So, I mean, that's the first thing. Check. As a <laughs> she, but she is a beautiful woman. She's gorgeous. Really beautiful woman. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. But she doesn't drink. And I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I don't have to deal with that. Right? But a lot of people can't do that. They can't not drink. And a lot of people have a big problem with it. And it's affecting their prettiness. It's affecting everything. And so they hate her. But she knows how to deal with it. You know, it's taken her years, years to deal with it. They hate it. They just hate her. And so be ready. When you come out and you're like, I love Jesus, that annoys people. But then when you're filled with the joy, and like these things aren't bothering you as much because you're filled with the fruit of the Spirit, and you're just like, love, joy, peace, patience. Don't do it like that. But anyway, because that's annoying. But, you know, just, but when you're just radiating that, it will, it will radiate from you. It will come out. You won't be able to help it. You're going to get hate. Get ready for the haters. It's going to happen, right? So get ready. So that's why what? They're sent out how? Two by two. Partnership. Make good friends who will encourage you, build you up. Don't hang around those. Like I was talking to my daughter. Don't hang around those losers anymore. <laughs> I don't know if you can say that in a sermon. I just did. So anyway, but get new friends. Get church friends. And that's why. The church is where you find the good people. Because clearly by now it should be obvious to you that I'm really good at chasing the wrong people out. 
So they're not going to be here for very long. They're not here. We're a family. We're like a family without the drama. And so it's great. I do not, if you know everyone, like, been here for a while. I don't tolerate drama. No drama. You, no. No. No name calling. No gossip. No, no backbiting. That's what it sounds like to me, right? <laughs> no. No, we are all part of the body of Christ. We love one another, and that's it. Love, joy, peace, patience, one mind. That's it. We don't care where you came from, how much money you make, what color you are. doesn't matter. You are my brother and sister. I love you, right? That's it. I love you all. And so you don't have the drama. And so that will just lead to me closing uh, here. I'm going to tell you how you can connect with us if you want to and be a part of this crazy family. <laughs> Maybe like, oh. <laughs> anyway, but, you know, I'll tell you how you can, but that's my encouragement for you, okay? So I hope it was encouraging. It's a bit about missions, but it's important that you understand, right, how the function of the church works, how missions work. Most of all, how you can get connected with us. We want to partner with you. We want you to be a part of the family. <clears throat> we want you to just do life with us. We don't want you doing life alone. We're not called as Christians to do that. All right, so I hope that was encouraging for you this morning. Thank you for coming. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this time and for everyone who came in today and that you sent them in here. There's no coincidence. It's a God incident this morning. And so I just believe that I was just praying to a bunch of miracles. All these people are just your living miracles. And Lord, I love them so much. I know that you love them, and I love them because you do. And so I just pray you fill them with the Spirit, you encourage those who need to be encouraged so that we may be better vehicles for your grace, your mercy, your hope, your peace, and your love as we go out this week. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.